I love my job. My colleagues love their job. I've got a colleague here. She loves her job. Um, but uh, education, the education system in the UK at the moment is suffering. It seems to have got a bit of a cancer. These are headlines just, well, look at the dates, the last month. And we seem to be under a barrage of different bits of negativity coming from different sources and a lot of commentators actually saying that the education system, for some reason, is broken. I don't actually believe that. I don't believe for a second it's broken. And uh, this afternoon I'm going to argue why I don't believe it's broken. I think part of the problem, though, is this. Education system. They're two things. And actually, we need to look at it as two things. We need to break them apart and think of them differently. This is an education system. Sageta Maitra talks about how the education system came about and quite clearly stated that the education system was derived in Victorian times so that factory owners and the new colonies would have a workforce that was prepared for them. I wonder how many classrooms today look like that. Maybe some classrooms do look like that, but with pretty pictures on the walls. Potentially, we need to be looking at education slightly different. These are my children. Mia, Maisie, Jacob. They're all from the same gene pool. Well, I hope they're all from the same gene pool. Um, they all have the same environment at home. They're all very, very, very different. Mia, she's 13, she goes to an outstanding, outstanding secondary school. Jacob, he's six, he goes to an outstanding primary school. Maisie, she goes to nursery. Maisie loves nursery. Jacob hates school. Mia hates school. Why? He's six. How has he turned off education so soon? How has he got to a point where he's only just started on his educational journey that he comes home and says to me, Dad, I'm bored. I don't want to go to school. <coughs> well, that's wrong. Mia, well, she's a teenager. <sighs> Teenagers aren't supposed to like school, are they? Well, again, we've given her the best opportunities. And at the moment, she comes home and says exactly the same as Jacob. I hate school. This is a story of a journey as well. When I arrived at Hartstone Academy, it was one of the worst performing schools in the country. And I could have turned around and walked away from that school. What was happening in that school, the system had taken over because the school was in special measures. In fact, the school had been in special measures twice. The second time, they'd just thrown more of the system at the school and the children were breaking down. Just like my three, you imagine, you take those three, all different, but from the same environment, multiply them by 10. You've got a class. Multiply that by 10. All of a sudden, you've got 300, all different, in a school. But we treat them all the same. This school serves some of the poorest families in the UK. At the time that I got there, it was 39%. The standards were 39% below floor. Not good enough. And I turned around when I'd walked away from that school and thought, these guys need a chance. We need to do something with this school. And some of the things I'm going to talk about 
is a little bit of this journey, but a little bit of the work and the research that I've been doing into education as well. We did need to think slightly differently. The system was failing the school. And the first question I asked was, what is learning? And more to the point, why do we learn? And I don't mean why do we learn as in we need to pass tests. Why do we learn, us, human beings? What makes us learn? What's our passions? What's our motivations? Why do we do it rather than my teacher wants us to do it? My school wants us to do it. My parents want us to do it. Why do I want to do it? And I think when you actually look at learning and when you break it down, at the moment, we seem to have a system where the knowledge is the important thing. And we move that knowledge from one place to another. I am the teacher, therefore, I have the knowledge and you don't have the knowledge. I teach, you learn. And we're getting more and more and more of that in the education system. System. And actually, it's not the way forward. The way forward is you need to connect learning with something else. As human beings, we're socially driven. We socially come together. And actually, I propose this. What if we treat learning as being understanding rather than it being knowledge transfer? What if we socially construct it together so that my motivations and my passions can be shared with others and I can learn with others the way that I was built to do that? and the way that human beings are built to do that. So therefore, do we need to be looking at education quite differently? And this is one of the things at HeartSome that I did start to think about. Do we need to redefine learning? It's quite the opposite to what's happening to the UK education system at the moment. Because the UK education system at the moment wants us to redefine learning as knowledge transfer, not the other way around. This is the UK education system at the moment. It's a group of subjects, not connected, just delivered, mainly in packages of an hour. Sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit shorter. But the majority of the time, children move from one place to another, and they then sit there and they're fed some more information, then they move to another place. It's not connected. But our brain doesn't work like that. Our brain actually works in a completely different way. When you look at the brain, it's made up of billions and billions of brain cells. Those brain cells are very clever things because what they do is they connect together as they learn. Notice I will use the word connect. They connect together to make pathways. They themselves connect to make understanding happen. I was really fortunate because as part of my journey as a professional, I got to work with a neurologist, somebody who takes tops off heads and plays around in the brain. And I got to work with them for a little while because they were looking at learning. And actually, he turned around to me and said, Carl, schools are getting it wrong. Schools are getting it wrong because you teach in one part of the school and it's perfect. You go to the top end of this school and actually you've forgotten about learning. You've forgotten how the human body and the human brain works. And he was talking about foundation stage and key stage two. 
And the really interesting thing was the foundation stage children were learning through social interaction. They were talking to each other, they were stimulated, they were engaged, they were motivated. We went to key stage two classrooms, they were sat in rows. They were looking at a board with somebody stood at the front talking. And he was absolutely right. And when I connected the two things together, we started to get learning that looked very, very different. Actually, the system itself possibly is wrong. We have something called a curriculum. And in schools, what we do as leaders, we map that curriculum out over a long term. And we say, this part of the school is going to teach this, this part of the school is going to teach that. Then we have some medium term curriculum. This is where the teachers get involved. Learning is starting to be talked about at this point. Then we have some short term planning. And it is only at this point you really start to think about the children. Then you deliver it. What I propose and what we did at Heartsome is we turned it the other way around. And we actually started with this. Understand how the child ticks. What does that mean? Well, actually, understand how they learn, how their brain works, understand what motivates them, understand what interests them. Ask them how they want to learn. This picture was taken from Twitter only a week ago. And this was from an experiment where this child was asked to design their own learning environment, their own learning station. And this is what she came up with. This is how she wanted to learn. She'd been asked, what motivates your learning? How do you want to do it? And it's funny because at Heart's Home, we have something very, very similar. These children have all designed their own learning areas. Not one of them is sat at a desk. Not one of them has asked for a chair. But they're more productive now than they ever were sat at a desk. Their handwriting is neater than it ever was. They choose people to sit with and work with. They don't work in ability groups anymore. We've lost the word special needs group. We don't use that term in our school because everybody is on the same level because they're working together, connected together. That doesn't mean their attainment is the same. It just means there's no difference in the school anymore. And I get adults saying to me, this is ridiculous. How could you ever do this? Not giving children tables and chairs. It's a fundamental right. But do you know the funny thing? When you give adults this choice as well and get them to design their learning environment, look what happens. Look at the chair. There's another one over there somewhere. When you actually think about it, do humans want to sit at desks? If I'd have given you a range of beanbags today, would you have sat on those instead of where you're sitting now? Are you comfortable? Are some of you falling asleep? I know you are, because you've gone glazed over. But look at this. There's one beanbag there, there's a chair here, chair there, chair there, another beanbag there, and they're sitting on the floor. Here's another group. No chairs, no, nothing at all, but they've decided to sit on the floor because they've designed their own areas to learn in. So, what makes people tick? How does it work? I think that is fundamentally where we must start. The next thing is making and designing their own learning environments. What's important at Heart's Home is we've looked at the learning environment and it's designed to stimulate the children's senses. It's designed to connect the learning together. When we worked with the neurologist, he said to me, 
actually, by stimulating the five senses, what you're going to do is get the brain really going. And then I have other people saying to me, oh, but that's not very good for autistic children. Actually, our, aut our autistic children are thriving in this environment. And I mean thriving, outperforming the majority of their peers in this environment because they can connect the learning together. And at Heart's Home, we design our classrooms with that in mind. We have put a range of environments together that the children can interact with. They can taste, they can touch, they can smell, they can hear. There's noise. And actually, what's the most important thing is they're stimulated. Here we are, I've got what, four four-year-olds. They shouldn't be doing that. They've chosen to sit and read in their environment. They should be running around being normal four-year-old boys. But by giving them and empowering them and giving them stimulation to play like this, what it's done is refocus what they're doing. What if we give them materials so that they could explore their own thinking? The idea of drawing on tables. A lot of people have said, well, it's graffiti. Well, actually, no. They're engaged. They're learning. They're enjoying it. They can work together. They can connect together. And socially, we have environments where they do exactly that. You can even do it in secondary school. This is a secondary school that has gone down the immersion route. We call this immers uh, immersive learning. And these guys in secondary school are doing exactly the same thing. They've changed their learning environments to stimulate what they're learning about. It's all quite interesting when you look at the dynamics of how those environments do stimulate. The next thing that we've really looked at is designing learning opportunities that are relevant and engaging. Notice I use the word design, not plan. We're designing these things from scratch each time to enable the children to access their learning. Relevant and engaging. Well, here is an example of exactly that. What we've got here is this weekend. It's just gone. This is a museum in a public place. We call it the showroom, uh, which is in Lincoln. And our five and six-year-olds were told at the beginning of the term, every bit of learning you do this term will be shown to strangers, members of the public. We're going to go out there, we're going to market to the public, and you're going to put a museum together before Christmas. Then each and every single one of you will display your work. So it's got to be of a high standard. That makes it relevant. All of a sudden, you've got their attention because they are showing their work to strangers. Therefore, the work that they produce has also got to be of a high standard. They will critique it together. They will rework it. They will redraft it and make it the best it possibly can be. But not only just their work, they're also going to do something called POLs, presentations of learning. The children were in their museum, and as strangers came round, they were talking about their topics. So they had to know them. They had to alert, they had, had to have learned them. That makes it engaging. And you can see that actually when you get that work and you display it beautifully and you have people, members of the public coming around and they start to talk about it, the technical language starts to come out. What's really telling is when you look at those things and you put them together, they're actually quite non-traditional. The next bit is also non-traditional because this is about staff. When you're actually thinking about the staff in your school, what we have done is they put all of that together and then they have professional dialogue to make it better. 
We call it project tuning, where we sit together and we discuss it to make it the best it possibly can be and link all the learning together. Finally, we link it to the curriculum just to make sure the system's happy. Then we deliver it to the children. The difference between the two is striking. The system wants us to start from central governance. Our way finishes with the system. It doesn't start with the system. We start with the child. And that's vital for the learning to take place. This is our curriculum at HeartZone. And actually, it's broken down into four distinct pedagogies, four distinct activities that we do not come away from. Reverse learning we just talked about, immersive learning, changing the environment, project-based learning, making learning relevant, challenge-based learning, giving them a challenge. And when you link all that together, what happens is you get relevant and engaging equals motivation. And actually, it starts to be about them, why they want to learn, not why somebody else wants them to learn. And when you put that together with a, uh, a scaffold of uh, various activities, you get a curriculum that actually produces some fantastic results. And you end up looking not at the subjects and the knowledge behind those subjects. You end up looking at a different range of skills that you're progressing rather than it being about the knowledge that's being imparted. And through that, you do get these fantastic outcomes. And I am not saying that we steer away from the outcomes. The outcomes are important. But what we get is world-class outcomes. We take our children and we ensure that they have a love for progress. We ensure they learn how to learn. Make sure they're passionate about learning. Make sure they're creative and analytical. And what you actually end up with are outcomes where HeartZone was one of the worst in the country. It's now performing in the top 5% of all schools, and that includes independent schools. HMI came in, Ofsted, the system. They came to find out what we were doing, not for an inspection, just to find out what they were, we were doing. He was a jolly nice chap. And he made, he made our life quite unpleasant for a little while. However, by the end of it, he turned around and he said, this school is beyond outstanding. It is unbelievable, the things that you are doing. And the students themselves, end up being successful, confident, da 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 And people come from all over the world now to Hearts Home Academy just to see the outcomes in the students, just to come and speak to them and realise, actually, you can raise the bar. There doesn't have to be a glass ceiling on learning. We've broken that glass ceiling and we're telling these children that come from deprived backgrounds, you can be whoever you want but you can do it by you driving your learning, not by us pushing you. Actually, what is happening is you are pulling the teachers along or the facilitators along, as we call them, rather than the other way around. I want you just to have a look at this picture. I, I want to pick this out before I finish because this is the power of our critiquing system. We do multiple drafts of our work to make it better and we work together to make sure that um, they understand their next steps. That was the first draft. That was the last draft. The age of the child? Four. No glass ceiling. No glass ceiling at all. So, is our education system broken? No. 
what the problem is, is actually we've got to forget about the system. And we've got to focus on the education. And to focus on the education, we've got to focus on the children. Thank you very much.